now we can call true functions orthogonal if their product and their inner product is equal to zero just like we call true vectors orthogonal if their inner product is equal to zero so now we have to stop associating the word orthogonal with perpendicular because there's actually nothing about two functions that are orthogonal that are really perpendicular we now use these funky things to denote vectors the bra and the ket we've defined an inner product between two functions, not just vectors, which is just their integral over a certain interval. And, and this generalizes to multiple dimensions, of course. But there are still a lot of things that we haven't defined. So what can we do? Well, let's get into it. First, we're going to define what we call normal functions. Now, a normal function We'll borrow from a normal vector, right? Now, at first you might think, hey, normal functions are weird, because wouldn't that require that the magnitude of f always be 1? Doesn't that only work for either constant functions or, I mean, step functions like this, sine of x, uh, and not by, not like the trigonometric function, I mean like the step function, sine of x. But, this is not what it means. What does normal actually mean? Well, a normal vector is a vector whose norm is 1. But what is the norm even defined as? Well, the norm is defined as the square root of the result of taking the inner product of the vector with itself. Hey, wait a second. What if we apply that to function? So, if this is 1, then the integral over some interval of f squared, this has to be positive, at least if this is complex, then you can just take its modulus, that is that, then this is normal. Notice how striking of a resemblance this bears to the fact that this probability density function integral over the entire real line is 1. Hence, it's normal over the entire real line. Simple. So, you can orthonormal to each other now. And just like orthonormal vectors make up a basis in R2 and R3, like i, j, and k are all basis vectors that are orthonormal. Orthonormal functions can make up a totally cool basis of their own. But that's what we'll talk about for another time. Statistical interpretation has to be 1. But, hey, wait a second. That's dx. What happens when we generalize that to multiple dimensions? Well, when we do this, we have to change the wave function accordingly. Well, we actually don't have to change it. If we want to see the probability function directly, it's still just this. But you can also now define the expectation value of a linear operator, like let's call this operator Q for quantum mechanics by taking the integral over the real line of psi q, psi constant, and notice that if q is the identity, then this just reduces to 1. And this allows us to assign some value to, you know, something that shouldn't even have a value. The expectation value of an operator, how ridiculous. And yet it exists. Now, one more thing. These operators don't just act like random variables, they also act like matrices. Recall that if we take the Hamiltonian operator and multiply it by psi, take it equal to the energy multiplied by psi, this at the end of the day is just the time-independent Schrodinger equation. 
And yet, it looks oddly similar to this equation. The equation to find the eigenvalue, where A is a matrix and C is a scalar. We already compared psi to a vector, so we identify it with this. And so these two identify with each other. These two, these two identify with one another. So it's only natural to start treating the Hamiltonian like A. Now the Hamiltonian has eigenvalues that we can solve for. And in fact, we already know what these eigenvalues are. We covered it the other day. We can shift between one or the other using ladder operators. So you can find the eigenvalue of an operator now. Not just that, you can find its expected value. You can plug the Hamiltonian in here, and it will make sense. How ridiculous is that? So, H bar. Okay, there we go. So, you just like, well, not just like, a matrix can have finitely many eigenvalues, sometimes with multiplicities. The Hamiltonian operator, for example, has infinitely many eigenvalues. You can keep applying the ladder operator upwards infinitely, and you'll get as many eigenvalues as you possibly need. That is the uncertainty principle. And that is going to come back to bite us when we're trying to generalize from 1D to 3D. You see, the uncertainty principle gets a lot, a lot more complicated. But there's a nice equation at the end of the day that perfectly encapsulates everything that the uncertainty principle tries to tell us. It perfectly encapsulates the fact that the lower precision you make your momentum, the higher precision you give your wavelength. And the same way, the higher precision you give your momentum, the lower precision you give your wavelength. Now, that is what we're going to be covering next time in our journey to generalize everything from 1D to 3D. But that's not all. At the end of our 1D lectures, we plugged in a bunch of actual potentials. Because, you know, it's nice to work with some in-the-field examples. You have to actually solve these equations if you want to become a physicist. And now, you know, we can't just finish with the theory, with the concept. Soon, will be forced to actually solve equations with examples for the 3D case.